Welcome to another edition of Ask Ron. Uh, I'm not imitating Greg Valentino. These are transition lenses. I was just outside taking out the trash. These should lighten up as I go along. And if not, well, at least you don't have to look into my beady little eyes. So I got some good questions. Um, not all bodybuilding related, but that's okay. It's, you know, we have other interests, don't we? First one comes from a guy named Heroes Fall. This is the the bodybuilding question, and it's a fairly long one. So the best bang for your buck on a blast, and for those of you, that's just terminology for uh, a steroid cycle. Uh, a lot of people will blast and cruise. Blast means you're on a large amount. Cruise is in between the large amounts when you're on smaller amounts. So blast is when you're trying to really grow. Best bang for your buck on a blast is to be lean beforehand so your body more optimally, optimally uses the hormones for muscle and you gain less or comparably less as a net total fat during the cycle. How do you increase your food intake on a cycle or blast? And then when you finish your blast and return to TRT levels or off cycle, how do you manage your food intake? The goal is to maintain or keep what you've gained, but continuing to eat the same level to keep the muscle will also make you fat as your metabolism isn't the same. Similarly, you want to maintain intensity and strength in the gym to keep your gains, but you're also no longer as strong as when on higher doses. So how the hell is that supposed to work? Uh, he's got a two-part question. So I'm going to start with that one. Um, yeah, I don't believe you should be eating as much in general when you're off cycle or cruising as you would while you're blasting. That being said, uh, particularly protein is the macronutrient I would be adjusting up and down. Your body, uh, you know, I don't have all the studies and references, but you can you can find them if you really look. Your body much better utilizes protein when you're on a blast, when you're on high levels of steroids versus, you know, your normal hormone levels, which on a cruise, if you're on TRT levels, theoretically, you're just at normal testosterone levels. You're not on anything exceptional. So what I would do, what most people do, what I've always done for the past, you know, probably about 10 years or more, is if I had to guess, I'd probably eat about 33%, about a third more protein. So uh, say I'm, I'm always around 225, 235. That's, that's the weight my body just likes to be at, whether I'm blasting, cruising, whatever. Uh, it takes a lot. I have to, for me to get down like 220 or below, I have to be pretty strict on my diet for at least a month, six weeks and hit the cardio to get down to there. Um, so if I was doing say 400 grams of protein on a blast, uh, when I'm cruising, I would take that down to 300. Uh, two reasons. Uh, number one, you, I don't believe your body can utilize as much protein when you're not on mega, you know, super physiological doses of steroids. So it's a waste. You're just going to excrete it or it's going to be stored as fat, that extra protein. So I would take that down. And when I'm, when I would be on, if I was using more, if I was on higher amounts of gear, I would want, you know, optimal results. I would want the most amount of protein. So that's when I would bump it up. Carbs, uh, similar, but I mean, I don't really play with my carbs as much you know I found especially as I get older my metabolism is slowing down I can't eat as many carbs as I used to without gaining body fat for a younger person I would imagine uh, you would want to use eat more carbohydrates while you're blasting uh, I, if I if mine are uh, if there's a difference for me it's probably you know minimal it's probably like somewhere between 10 and 20 percent more or less depending on the amount of uh, hormones in the system and it's it's really just a matter of uh, what your body's using and what it can and cannot use you know give your body what it needs and what's optimal when it is in that environment that hormonal environment when it can utilize that extra protein and you know turn it into muscle gain as opposed to when you're not and it's just going to be fat and the second part of the question of that first question uh, you want to maintain intensity and strength in the gym to keep your gains, but you're not as strong as when on higher doses. Yeah, you, you want to keep as much as possible. You're not going to keep all your strength and all your size. That's If that was the case, if you could maintain 
all the size and strength off steroids as you could on steroids, that would mean steroids really don't work, or it would, it would also mean that uh, you could use them and the, the effects, the, the results that you get would be permanent and they're not. As I've said before many times, you keep a part of those gains, size and strength. You know, if you're really diligent and you keep training hard and you keep eating well and getting enough rest, you should be able to keep, and it's an individual thing, anywhere from 50 to 75 percent of the gains that you made on that cycle. And like I've said before, over time that adds up. So say you gain five pounds of, of lean tissue mass on a cycle and then maybe another, you know, 10 pounds of fat and water. But let's just talk about the five pounds of fat. I'm sorry, five pounds of muscle. So if you gain five pounds of muscle on a cycle, then you go off the cycle. Let's say you keep three of those pounds. That's pretty good, actually. If you can keep three out of the five pounds of muscle. Three pounds of muscle, like I said, that doesn't sound like much, right? If you're doing two or three of those cycles a year, let's say you're doing three, okay? Three pounds times three, nine pounds of new muscle mass, permanent new muscle mass a year. Uh, two years, that's 18 pounds of muscle. That's almost 20 pounds of brand new muscle that you did not have when you were training naturally. You never would have had probably. Uh, 18, then you add that on, 27 pounds, uh, 36 pounds, on and on and on. Obviously, it doesn't work exactly like that in such a linear fashion, but you get the idea. Um, so you want to train hard, but you also want to cut back. Uh, one thing I see people do that I think screws them over, sabotages their, their ultimate results, is they train the same when they're on blast, when they're using a lot of gear, as when they're either on a TRT, you know, maintenance dose, or off completely. Now, you don't have the same recovery ability. Your body can't recover the same way that it did. So you shouldn't be doing uh, the frequency of training. You should probably throw in an extra rest day or two a week that you're not training with weights. You shouldn't do the same volume. You know, if you're doing, uh, let's say, 30 sets for legs. I'm just throwing numbers out there. While you're on, you probably should not be doing 30, 30 sets. You should take that down to like 20. Uh, you shouldn't be doing as many techniques like drop sets, supersets forced reps, all that stuff, because those all take a toll, an increased toll on your recovery ability. They're doing more damage to the muscle fibers. And why would you do that when you don't have that hormonal environment to support the muscle growth or the muscle repair and growth and recovery, that whole process? It doesn't make sense, but people do it because, you know, they have the right intention. They think, I just got to keep training as hard. Yeah. In a, in a certain respect, you want to keep trying to go as heavy. You're not going to be as strong. That that's inevitable. You're not going to be, say let's say you're pressing uh, 140s on a flat dumbbell press while you're on gear. Uh, then you go off. You can't expect to keep using those 140s. Some people can. That's great. Some people are just naturally strong anyway. If there's there's a lot of people out there that are much more geared towards strength than mass. They don't ever get very big, but they're incredibly strong people. And that's more to do with their nervous system and the tendons and ligaments and the leverages of their bones. Strength is, is a much different, much different thing. But anyway, you go as heavy as you can. So, you know, say you were doing 140s for 10 and that was to failure. You still want to train to failure. But maybe now it's 130s or 125s. You're still training hard. You're still training heavy, but it's relative. You can't, you can't, like I said, if, if drugs didn't, if steroids didn't make you bigger and stronger, there'd be no point in using them. So when you're off, you do as, as you train as heavy as you can, you eat as well as you can, uh, realize that your metabolism is going to be a little slower. You can't get away with the amount of carbs and, and the junk food, the fast food, things like that. You will get fatter because you don't have these drugs doing these uh, intricate things in your system at the time. Uh, second part of this question. From Heroes Fall. Similarly, if you spend 12 weeks on, 12 weeks off, you can, in theory, cycle twice a year. If you bulk on your first cycle to gain mass, then spend 12 weeks maintaining your mass. Are you supposed to use the next cycle to cut? If you cut on TRT or normal hormones in the 12 week normal periods, do you not put your body in a position to not keep the progress? Perhaps I'm missing something. My personal thought is blasting or cycling is used to add the size. Um, Steroids do two things, basically. They help you build muscle, and they help you retain muscle. Your body is naturally is always fighting against those two processes. 
your body always wants homeostasis. It always wants to stay the same. It doesn't want more lean muscle mass, more tissue, more weight that now it's got to support with more calories because where are these calories going to come from? We evolved from these hunter gatherers that you know, they'd go days, maybe weeks without eating at times. You know, they couldn't find any damn berries or a mastodon to kill. So, you know, we evolved with this adaptive metabolism that will slow down in times of famine. And that's how that's how our ancestors survived. And that's why we're a species. It's uh, still kicking around when all these the dinosaurs and a lot of these other species, uh, early early hominids are all gone like Neanderthals. Anyway, I'm getting off on a tangent there. So the point I'm trying to make is uh, steroids can be used for whatever you want them to. Can you use them to build? Absolutely. Can you use them to retain muscle mass while you're losing body fat? Absolutely. Um, I think it's actually easier to build muscle mass, not to the extent that you would with steroids, but it's easier to build muscle mass without steroids than it is to hold on to all your muscle mass while getting very lean without steroids. Uh, getting lean means that you're taking less calories, you're doing more cardio. These are catabolic things. These put your body in that catabolic state. And without steroids to maintain an anabolic environment and preserve the muscle tissue, you will lose muscle tissue along with the fat. If you've been to natural bodybuilding shows, and before you guys all laugh, I'm talking about shows where you know, you're looking at the guys, you know they're clean. They're usually pretty, pretty ripped, shredded, but they're not very big. They don't have that fullness and the thickness and the roundness. Most of the time, they, they don't have that at all. They're shredded. They could have, uh, in the off season, you see pictures of them, and they do have a lot more of that fullness and thickness, roundness, but they're carrying body fat. When they get down to very, very low body fat levels, and I've been to natural shows, many of them, where guys have ripped glutes, striations, the triceps, cross and the quads, tries, all over the place. These guys are in great shape. They're not very big. Um, but then you go to non-tested shows where the guys diet down to that same condition, but with the assistance of drugs, now they carry much, much more mass they're really able to maintain, retain almost all their mass, if not all of it. Some of them even build mass going into shows. Uh, that's a case where when people, when people stay very lean, it's a lot more feasible to gain muscle going into a show. But, you know, how do you use these 12 weeks on, 12 weeks off? That, that's an individual matter. Some people, they don't care about being lean. So every cycle that they do, the goal is just to gain mass. And they'll keep eating tons and tons of food. You know, not doing cardio because the goal thereafter is more size, more strength. That's fine. You know, everyone can have their own goals. And who am I to say? Who are you to say if that's right or wrong? We all want something slightly different for ourselves, right? So if you want to use uh, one 12 week cycle a year, theoretically, 16, 12, 16, whatever, to gain, and then use another one to maintain the mass while you get really, really lean, that's something a lot of people do. A lot of competitors who compete either just once a year or in the same season, maybe, I mean, the same, same time frame. they'll hit maybe like two or three shows within a, within a month or six weeks. You know, typically they'll be blasting or doing a, an off season bulking cycle, so to say, uh, you know, months and months before that, then they'll take time off, let their system clean out a little bit. And, you know, they'll, they'll, lose, they'll lose some size, but the smart ones, while they do that, they will start dieting and start getting lean so that when they begin their diet phase, their, their prep, which will be generally 16 weeks, and then they throw, throw in all this gear, then they can get much better results. Um, but there are people that, you know, they, only, they, they stay lean all the time. And they use all their cycles to try to gain a little bit more lean muscle tissue. I mean, there, there's no rules. And people do all different kinds of things based on what their preferences are. So, you know, gear is just, it's a tool that people use for whatever purpose they want. Uh, you know, and these 12 on, 12 off, it would be ideal if people did that. It took as much time off as on, but a lot of people won't do that. And going off cycle, you know, as we've talked about with the anabolic doc, Going off cycle for a lot of guys who've been using for a while isn't really even an option because their body just doesn't make, it's not, it's not going to rebound. They're not going to bounce back and start making tests again. They just don't, their bodies aren't capable of it anymore. They've destroyed that capability. So they always need to be on a TRT dose minimum. Okay. Uh, Goon 
threw a question out there about calling uh, Carl's death on The Walking Dead two years ago. Yes, you did. Uh, I didn't want it to happen. I love Carl. Carl's the same age as my son, Christian, uh, the character and the actor. So to, to watch him die, it was, it was rough. Uh, okay, Kinnick. Kinnick wanted to know, why do you always say Boston Lloyd is a good kid when in reality he has horrible moral values as a human being? I don't think Boston's a bad kid. Uh, I do think he is slowly maturing. This latest episode where he was uh, on his Facebook showing before and after pictures of uh, Synthol, his th Team 3CC Synthol brand before and afters on an arm of a 16-year-old who apparently is uh, in Australia. Uh, that When I saw that, I was just taken aback because 16 years old, hmm. You know, I have, I have a lot of issues with anybody under 21 using steroids. 18, legally you're an adult. I'm, I'm not cool with it at all, at all, but at least 18 you're an adult. 16, damn, you're still a kid at 16. And I don't care if you're 6'2 and you have a little mustache at 16. You're still a 16-year-old kid. You're very immature. Uh, there's a reason. You, you can't vote at 18. You can't, uh, can't buy alcohol. You can't buy a gun at 16. All these things that we consider being adults. I mean, most states now, you can't even get your driver's license at 16. It has to be 16 and a half or 17, something. So when he does things like that, I have to question, you know, what's, come on, boss, what are you doing? And, you know, he'll, he, he said, I believe, something to the effect of this kid's going to find, I don't know if it was him or someone else on his Facebook page post and said, the kid's going to get sent all anyway if he wants it. At least my, my, his brand is is uh, sterile and I'm going to tell him exactly how to use it safely. Now, I don't know if synthol can be used safely. Uh, you know, what are the long-term effects? I mean, I've heard a lot of people talk about, even the anabolic doc has talked about, eventually it's going to have to be filtered out through the kidneys and, you know, the, the, there's just so many things about synthol we don't know about the long-term and what it's really, what it does in the body and over the long-term. I'd be very, very, very uncomfortable if my teenage son was on steroids, obviously, but synthol too. I mean, even though it's not illegal, you can buy synthol legally, uh, which is kind of crazy, but it's not a drug. It's, it's like MC, it's NCT oil, I believe. So it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I get along well with Boston. I do like him. I think he's a good kid deep down. Um, but when he does things like this, even I have to think, <sighs> What are you doing? What are you doing, Boston? You can't, don't sell the kids. Don't work with kids on drugs that young. He can do whatever he wants and he will do whatever he wants. But I have a real issue with that. 16, I think last year there was a 15 year old kid that was, he was coaching that was putting up progress picks all the time. And that, that really bothers me because, you know, I'm a dad. I have kids. Uh, my son's 18. My daughter's going to be 24. I mean, next month. So I'm, I see these things from a parent's point of view, and I'd be very, very upset if someone sold my 16-year-old child, because a 16-year-old is a child. I don't care if they have muscles or a little scruffy beard. They're still a kid. They're a child. Uh, synthol. So, I don't know. Still, still, the jury's out on that one. I mean, we saw what happened. I, I tried the Boston Lloyd show here. It didn't work. That's been done to death. I'm going to move on. Uh, let's run for it. I wanted to know. I'd like to know your thoughts on your son getting that big sleeve. By no means it is a bad tattoo. It's impressive. I'm not a dad yet. 27 days till our due date. Congratulations. Your world's about to change, guy. But I think I'd freak out if my 18 or 19-year-old son got a big tat like that. Was it a negotiation? Curious. So, you know, obviously I have plenty of tattoos. My wife has plenty of tattoos. My daughter has a good amount already at, the, at her age. So... It wasn't like it was out of character for this household, right? But I didn't get my first tattoo until 2002. I was 32 years old. So, yeah, when he told me he wanted a tattoo, and, you know, he turned 18 last September, and he said, you know, when I'm 18, I, I, I want a tattoo. I'm like, oh, boy. You know, I, I couldn't stop him if I wanted to, right? But, you know, I was I tried to impress upon him that, at 18, I can't imagine there's any tattoo you would get at age of 18 that by the time you're 30, 40 years old, you could look at it and, and still think that was cool. Then again, I've had that 
I've had that argument thrown at me all these years from people, sorry, it's hot up here, from people saying, you know, you're, you're going to be 70, 80 years old and your tattoo is going to look stupid. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, if I'm 70, 80 years old, I'll just be happy to still be alive and kicking and running around. I wouldn't be worried about whether my tattoos don't look cool anymore or if I don't like them anymore. But, you know, all that being said, uh, he got a huge piece. It's, uh, let me throw up the picture. It's a full sleeve, shoulder, chest, part of his back. But it's really well done. It was uh, it's Eastern style. It's a dragon. It's really bright colors, very vibrant. We, I helped him find a really good artist, uh, 200 bucks an hour, this guy. But he was worth it. He did excellent work, line work, colors. You know, I, I didn't know a lot about tattoos until a few years, until a few years ago I started watching Ink Master, and now I actually know I can spot uh, really break down good tattoos and bad tattoos. And this is a really good tattoo, and I think it's, it's classical. It's, you know, that old Japanese style. It's, it's, it's never going to be out of style. I don't think he's going to, you know, look at it and regret it. He actually says he wants a lot more. He says he wants his whole body covered, but, you know, we'll see. Uh, so there wasn't a negotiation, but it was, I had to help him out with the money. He paid for a little less than half of it. I, I helped uh, with the rest, obviously. And I, I went with him for every appointment. And he took it like a champ. Didn't make one whimper. Uh, nothing. You know, stoic the whole time. Listened to the music that they were blasting and uh, took it like a champ. Uh, but yeah, I wasn't thrilled that he got it. But I'm not really upset. It's not like he got anything offensive. He didn't get a face tattoo. He didn't get anything uh, that can't be covered up if he goes into the corporate world. I mean, it's it only it doesn't even, it doesn't go past the elbow. So he could always put uh, maybe a little past the elbow. He could cover it up. He could wear a shirt. No one's going to even see it. Uh, whereas mine. You know, I got, some, I got one on the back of my neck. I got these ones that go all the way down the wrist. But, you know, this is my job. I work at home and I, it doesn't matter. I could be, I could have face tattoos. It wouldn't matter. It's not like I'm going out for a corporate job or anything like that. But, uh, yeah. last question from R. Zoller. Will the new Lara Croft, this is played by a Swedish woman named Alicia Vikander, 29 years old, be successful with significantly less boobage? Will that have beneficial or detrimental results on her tomb raiding capabilities? So I haven't seen the movie. Uh, is it even out yet? I don't think so. I've watched the trailer a few times. Uh, she's a beautiful girl, and she's much more athletic looking. She actually looks like she works out. To me, uh, Angeline Jolie, she kind of had some athletic looking legs, but her upper body was pure skin and bones as far as I'm concerned. She did have larger breasts. <laughs> this girl has proportionate sized breasts. I think she's beautiful. I, I, I want to see the movie when it either when it comes out or maybe I'll wait till uh, Blu-ray or something. But uh, I, I'm sure because this is like this is 20 years later, the CGI is going to be so much better. Uh, the first one I, I didn't think that was it was that great. I mean, I watched it because just to look at Lara Croft or Angelina Jolie, basically. Uh, but no, it wasn't like a great movie or anything. <laughs> So this probably won't be a great movie either, but it'll have a lot of action, a lot of cool action scenes, cool CGI, and yeah, I like this girl's look a lot. Um, no, you know, I don't care about big boobs. I'm a, I'm a butt guy, so you, you asked the wrong guy about uh, whether whether it was going to be a worse movie or a worse Lara Croft because her boobs were all smaller. Yeah, I don't care. I haven't seen this girl's butt. I'm interested too, of course. I love butts. I cannot lie. So that is it. That's going to do it for this edition of Ask Ron. Uh, I'd ask you guys to check out my Instagram and please follow me because I still don't have 10,000 followers. It's at Ron Harris Muscle. Yeah, I don't even have 10K, guys. That's, that's really weak, really weak. So please, help a brother out. Thanks for watching. Talk to you next time.